Well, welcome Earth Space class. This is attempt number four at this particular lecture. Um, I wanted to start it with consideration of uh, a topic we talked about last time, that being uh, the apparent motion of the sun, moon, and stars as they seem to rise in the east and set in the west. Uh, in actuality, that is, crea that is created by um, our motion on Earth, as the Earth is actually moving from west to east, or spinning from what we would say is west to east. It's making it look like the stars are rising in the east and setting in the west. Here is the North Star right in the middle here, and these are circumpolar stars, but it would be the same on the horizon if you would kind of imagine drawing a line through the North Star. We would see those stars seeming as, as the night progressed, so this is sort of a time lapse. Uh, those stars seeming to rise in the east and set in the west. Now, uh, stars that are circumpolar, we can see all night, we can see them describe an entire arc around the night sky. But um, this is all created because we are, in fact, are moving from west to east, making it look like the sky is moving in the opposite direction. So I just thought you might appreciate that particular video, and uh, I'm going to exit out of it, and um, yeah, we'll go on to the next topic. So today we're going to be talking about the moon, and... Um, if I can actually get this to show up, there we go. There's a, there's a good picture of the moon at moonrise, and it looks huge. And, um, and the reason for that, uh, again, we'll explain this better in class, but um, when you're looking at the moon through moonrise, you're, it's, it, you're looking at it through a much greater layer of Earth's atmosphere. And so that tends to scatter the light. Only the red hues of light get through best. And that's why it has a reddish hue to the sky and even the moon, but it's mostly yellow here, but reddish hue, because only those red wavelengths uh, can get through. Um, when that moon rises, uh, it will be um, shining light through an ever thinner layer of atmosphere, and it will actually shrink in size because there's less scatter of the light coming from the moon, and, uh, and it will get smaller as it rises and brighter as it rises. Um, if I had to ask you how far the moon was away when you look at an image like this, um, I think we would probably get a range of estimates. And if you ask an elementary class, uh, you get a big range of estimates. And so um, the real fact of the matter is it's roughly about 240,000 miles away. So if you get in your car and you drive at 70 miles an hour uh, without ever stopping for food or gas or anything, you would have to drive for almost five months at 70 miles an hour continuously to drive from Earth to the moon. It's a multi-day trip even on a space shot that's doing 17,000 miles an hour. So yeah, you can do the math there. So uh, yeah, it's far, it's, it's a long ways away, but um, still it's the uh, you know, closest big celestial body that we have on Earth. Um, it also uh, shines brightly. It reflects sunlight back on us. You'll see in your notes it says it has a magnitude of negative 12.7. Now that doesn't mean a lot yet. When we get to stars, it will. But um, when we talk about magnitudes, uh, the, the smaller the number, so the more negative the number, the brighter the feature. So the sun would have uh, a, a magnitude of negative 27. Uh, the, the, the moon is a magnitude of negative 12.7. I'll explain that a little bit more, but just to give you a comparison, a point of comparison. Okay, it takes about 29 and a half days for the Earth to complete a lap around um, the Earth, for the Moon to complete a lap around the Earth, and that, that orbit of the Moon is tilted uh, uh, just a bit, uh, about five degrees, and that's why uh, one of the reasons we have, uh, sometimes we have um, uh, lunar eclipses, and, um, and sometimes we don't, and, and so if you can picture the, the Earth going around the Sun, um, as it's doing that, it's carrying the Moon with it. So as the Earth is orbiting the Sun, the Moon is orbiting the Earth. But it does so in a rather unique way. And that's what this clip illustrates. I'm not going to make it bigger, folks. This is giving me troubles with uh, my recording. So hopefully you can see this. Okay, so here's the motion of the Earth moving west to the east, as I said. And um, this animation uh, adds in some, some features gradually, and I think it really helps uh, in our understanding of what's going on. And so there they're talking about that. Okay, so now here, no, notice the moon. Notice how as it orbits the sun, it's, or sun, as it orbits the earth, it's, it's, its orbit, its spin, I should say, is synchronized with earth's. Look at that so that we always see the same side of the moon. 
Uh, if you ran to one side of the Earth and then quick ran to the other, you could actually see about 60% of the moon's surface, but there's 40% that you will never see because its orbit is synchronized with ours. Its spin, I'm sorry, is synchronized with ours. If I back it up to this. So its spin is synchronized with, with, with ours. So as it's on its orbital path, it's, it, we're only seeing that same side uh, of the moon. And, and to uh, give you some evidence for that, let's uh, take a look at the moon. So if we go here to Google Earth, and we can switch this to the moon, and um, it will show us the side of the moon that we tend to see. And uh, there are these dark areas and these light areas. People used to think that, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second, that those were seas. We'll get to that in a second. So this is the side of the moon that we see. But let's look at the other side of the moon. Ooh, it's very different. In fact, if you take a look at it, again, this is the side of the moon that we see, but the other side is very different. And the reason for that is, this is the side of the moon that is away from us. And so it is subjected to all the space debris flying at Earth that, that, that um, or, or at the moon, um, and, it, and that debris will hit the moon's surface. Um, the other side of the moon is protected because it's always facing Earth, so not as much debris hits it, so there's not as many um, craters in it. And so it's just a, 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 a verification of uh, the fact that there's a side of the moon that's, that's facing away from us that we never see, and that gets hit by a lot of space debris. And, um, and that illustration, I think, does a pretty good job of, of showing that. So if we look then at the moon, and its arrangement to the sun, with the sun. Um, we can see here, now this moon should actually be offset. So right here they have it pretty much on a straight line, but as I showed you, it should be offset by about five degrees. But um, there's, there's a position that's, that's important here. Um, the uh, moon then, when it's in the right position, will actually um, cast a, a shadow on the Earth, and of course um, that can create a, a solar eclipse. Um, but there are, there's sort of a two-part eclipse, so you, you may have noticed this. There are places where you can see a solar eclipse um, more brightly and, and, and less so. And so there's this um, two-part shadow that any, any object, so in this case it's the moon casting on Earth, but when we look at a lunar eclipse, we have uh, the Earth over here casting uh, a shadow on the moon, and uh, there's a two-part shadow. And so there's this outer part called the penumbra, and there's this inner part called the umbra. So this is a complete shading uh, of the of the um, of uh, that striking Earth's surface, and this is a partial shading that striking Earth's surface. And so if we then look at what that means um, for the moon. I'm going to go down one more here before we go back to that. So this, this is a moon as it's moving into an eclipse. So here it's moving into the penumbra, and there's a partial shading of the moon. But when it becomes this red color, that's when it moves into the umbra, and we have a complete shading of the moon. Notice, once again, the only colors that really get through uh, to illuminate the moon from the sun are those red colors that are uh, most able to penetrate uh, the greatest distances. And so we have what's called a blood moon. Okay, let me look at your notes. So we, um, I kind of jumped ahead just a little bit there, I guess. I want to go back to phases. We already talked about phases when it came to um, uh, Venus. And so here we have uh, phases. So here we have the sun, and here we would have Earth, and so we're viewing the moon. So when we're on Earth and the moon is directly in front of, well, if it's not an eclipse, it would be off by five degrees, but the, the sun is behind the moon, uh, we would call that new moon because we really wouldn't see it. The, the, the moon that we can see is, the side of the moon that we can see is not illuminated um, because it's opposite us. It would be over here and we would not see it from Earth. So then as the moon goes through its 29 and a half day cycle, when it uh, is more over on this side, then we look up at it, the sun is shining on it, um, but we only see a, a, a portion of its lit surface, we would call a crescent shape. It gets a little farther in its cycle and we look up at the moon and again the sun is illuminating it, um, and we would see then a quarter uh, uh, of, of its lit surface, we would only see this much to here, and that would be first quarter. You know, the, this, this half is lit, but we're only seeing that quarter. 
Then we get a little farther and uh, we see more of its lit surface. Not all of it yet, but, but more of it. And notice here it's chiseled, it's just right straight across, but here it's a little bulged out. And it's called a gibbous phase, and gibbous is Latin for pudgy or chubby. And that's what that phase of the moon is. When it moves from gibbous on uh, through the cycle a little bit farther, um, then, you know, this, again, this would be up or down from the Earth five degrees so that all of its lit, all of its lit surface would be showing uh, to us here on Earth is full moon. Of course, we're not seeing the backside of it, we're seeing all of its lit surface, and we have a full moon. Of course, this last um, October was particularly uh, eventful because we had a second full moon in the month of uh, October and it happened to fall on Halloween. We call a second full moon in any month a, a blue moon. That's, it's a rare thing, that's what we say, once in a blue moon. Well, one happened um, this last year, or this last October. Well, we go on a little bit farther and it's give us again, but now we're seeing less and less of its lit surface. We've gone from this to this and less yet. We got into third quarter. So, uh, yeah, first quarter, they, we don't call it second quarter, but that's the way the math works. And this would be third quarter and then waning crescent and then back to new moon. And so if we scroll down, here are all those phases um, in, in order, a little more detail. Um, as, as the moon progresses through its monthly uh, lunar phases. All right, so then if we look, I think that's what I wanted to say about moon. Oops, wrong way, this one. Yeah. Yep, okay, let me scroll down here. Um, and just want to reinforce this concept of a blood moon. Um, that's when uh, the moon uh, in, in its orbit and uh, around Earth, and Earth in its orbit around the sun, you have a, 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 an event where the Earth casts a shadow uh, on the moon and, and creating an, a lunar eclipse, and, um, and we can get a blood moon if we see uh, a full dose of that lunar eclipse. And here's a, here's a look at that five degree um, offset, if you will. So this would be, um, the red line would be Earth's motion around the sun, and this whiter line would be the moon's motion around Earth, and it's offset by about five degrees. And that's why we don't have an eclipse every month, but we do sometimes. All right. So I'm going to finish up uh, today's lecture with a couple of other astronomical features. Um, in your notes, uh, comets are next, and we talked some about comets already, so I'm not going to say as much about comets. Um, they have uh, these, uh, the tails. There's typically two parts to the tail. Uh, remember, comets are created uh, not because of their motion through the, through the sky, but because of the solar wind um, blasting uh, uh, energy at, at them and uh, taking some of the tail of the Earth, of the Earth, of the comet, and blowing it out beyond it. So this image that I showed you before shows you why comets have tails. So here's that solar wind blasting out from the sun and pushing some of that comet material out behind it and then making the, making the tails that we're, we're so familiar with seeing. Um, there are um, comets of various sorts. Halley's Comet, um, Halley, uh, Halley Anderson, yeah, hopefully um, yeah, you're, uh, you'll get to see uh, Halley's Comet when it returns next. I think it came last in the 80s, and I think it comes again in 2060s, uh, if I remember right. Um, so if we look at uh, where comets come from, there's a nice image that's helpful. Okay, so here is the four inner planets. So Mercury, Earth, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. This would be the asteroid belt. Okay, so if we um, kind of look at that, well, here, here's all of the planets here. And then here, this is a feature called the Kuiper belt. He was a Dutch astronomer. And so these are, are closer. In fact, Neptune and Pluto actually get out into the Kuiper belt. Um, we would call these short period comets because they, um, they come back uh, less than every 200 years or 200 years or less. And so Halley's would be one of those. So those comets exist in this Kuiper belt. But then there are long period comets, and those are ones that exist way out here. So here, if we shrink this Kuiper belt down to that little white dot, this whole big other feature here, this is called the Oort cloud. And it's, it's, it's uh, uh, where uh, comets exist, but it's, it's ones that don't come back for a long time. These are long period comets, more than 200 years. This, the, the Oort cloud is, is, as your notes say, uh, 50,000 astronomical units from the sun. That's a lot. So 50,000 times 93 million, that's how far away the Oort cloud is. Big deal. 
That's a, that is a big deal. Okay, so comets are, are other features that we have in our solar system that we see from time to time. And um, that image that I had here, oops. Let me go back up to this one. This is a good picture of a comet. So they'll linger in the sky. They won't just flash and be gone, but you'll see this appearance in the night sky for a month at a time. Um, so they're moving uh, around the uh, sun and the sun creating that tail, uh, but they're visible for long periods of time in the night sky. Something that does just flash uh, and, and is gone is, is the asteroids. And so um, if I go back to, oops, not that one. If I go back to the previous image, Oops, that's not what I wanted. Sorry about that, folks. Got the wrong, wrong button there. Um, so if we go, actually, I, I'm just thinking now I, um, I, I changed my mind again a little bit. And, uh, and so our solar, solar system, I'm going to go back to that image that I've used before. If it will open, there, not yet. thinking about opening. It doesn't want to open. Great. Okay. Having a great time with the computer today. Here we go. Okay. So here's where most of the asteroids exist. And Sirius is a good one. I showed you a picture of that in the trans-Neptunian objects uh, page that I uh, had or image that I had open before. So asteroids are, are, are larger, though those can be planetoids. They're, they're pretty big objects. And most of them orbit between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. And many astronomers believe that if they would coalesce into a planet, it would give us our ninth major planet uh, in the solar system. Okay, that's good. We don't want any of those to hit Earth and have any, uh, any, any uh, issues with that. Um, we know that uh, uh, one about 10 kilometers uh, in diameter hit Earth about 65 million years ago uh, at the Yucatan Peninsula uh, in Mexico. So if we go back here, go back to Earth, um, and that uh, is believed to be uh, at least in part responsible for uh, the death of the dinosaurs. So um, this is the Yucatan Peninsula. You don't really see that uh, remnant of that. There's about a 200 kilometer diameter kilometer, 200 kilometer in diameter crater uh, in this area. Uh, hard to see though, can't see it from Google Earth. Um, and you know that along with uh, uh, basalt lava flows uh, in India um, are believed to have caused the end of the dinosaurs. So it's a big deal. So 10 kilometers, you know, that's not terribly big. It's six miles, six and a half miles across. I mean, that's big, don't get me wrong. But when you consider Earth is uh, um, about 8,000 miles in diameter, something um, six and a half miles in diameter is kind of like a pea hitting it, it seems like. But of course it's not. And, and when that hit, um, it created a shock and it altered Earth's climate because it ejected so much dust and debris up into the atmosphere that bad things happened. Well, last thing um, then, so we don't want asteroids hitting, hitting us, and so meteoroids is the last item. And there's not a clear distinction between asteroids and meteoroids. Asteroids tend to be the larger objects, meteoroids tend to be the smaller objects. And so um, um, they do hit Earth and um, they tend to be small sand to boulder size. Um, objects and uh, you know the fact oh, the fact that they hit Earth um, can be verified by uh, by this young man. I think was it 20, uh, 2009, Garrett Blanc. He was uh, walking to school when, uh, as it says here, a ball of light headed straight to, straight towards him, and uh, something smacked into his hand. A red hot pea sized rock hit his hand, bounced off, and well, I don't know if it bounced off. Probably went straight because it made a foot wide crater in the ground in front of him. You know, that, that, that had to smart. It, it left a scar. It doesn't show up real good here. Maybe I can zoom in on this a little bit. We can see it maybe a little bit better. Um, so it left a scar in his hand right here, and there's the size of the object that hit him. So picture this. This thing is hurtling through space. It was probably quite a bit bigger when it was going through space. Probably lost most of its mass when it hit our atmosphere, and friction burned that mass up. Hurtling through space on a 
on a planet moving on and it and it's uh, it's it's heading towards a planet that's spinning and orbiting as it's going around the galaxy as the galaxy is flying out from the middle of the universe and and this kid is walking to school and uh, he just happens to walk to school um, at the time and in the location that um, gets him hit by that little p-shaped object in the hand right here I ask you what was he lucky or unlucky you know, I don't know. Uh, if he was uh, hit in the head or elsewhere in the body, it probably would have killed him. So he's lucky in that regard, unlucky that it hit him at all. Now, there's only been a few other instances of, of this happening, but uh, if you can find a meteoroid, uh, boy, they're, they're worth a lot of money. People will pay you a lot of money for them. Um, uh, so hopefully when we're back in class, I'll be able to show you a, a clip of one, or maybe I'll load it on, no, I'll probably, yeah, or maybe I'll load it on, on, on YouTube, uh, of, of one that hit Russia uh, in, I think it was 2014, Valentine's Day 2014, they thought we were attacking them. Uh, but it's a pretty good picture of, of what's going on there. Evidently, all the Russians have cameras, video cameras in their um, cars uh, so that if they get into crashes, they can prove um, they were not in the wrong or something of that sort. So anyway, uh, meteoroids, uh, meteors that burn up in the night sky are, uh, don't hit ground. And those are about the size of what Geert's holding here and uh, simply burn up in the atmosphere. If they're big enough, they have enough mass to withstand the friction of Earth's atmosphere and they get to ground, we would call them a meteorite. And they are rare. And that is where I will stop this time.